We're excited to have Jonathan here. I always like to qualify this and point out that you do not need to be a VMware customer or a Dell customer to take full advantage of all the tools offered by Cloud Health. When VMware purchased Cloud Health, they did it because of Cloud Health's tremendous reputation and expertise in helping organizations manage their hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environments from cost and administrative standpoint. We're going to have Jonathan go a little bit more granular into Kubernetes specific issues. Let's turn it over to him. The advantage though for Cloud Health being part of VMware and Dell Technologies is that they do have access to a wealth of data on cloud usage that helps them create products that are more effective for organizations of all sizes. All right, great. Thanks, Ron. Um, that's great. That's great setup, actually. That's great context. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and thanks, JJ, for a great presentation uh, following several other great presentations. So as Juan said, I thought we'd use the time here, 15 minutes, sounds like, a give or take, to talk about cloud financial management. Uh, what does that even mean in general? Very, very briefly, but then talk about um, the challenges specific to modern applications that, uh, uh, that layer on top of cloud financial management challenges where as you modernize your apps, use things like Kubernetes. Um, I think I uh, appreciate the intro, Ron. Uh, just once again, Jonathan Morin, product manager here at the Cloud Health team. Been at Cloud Health for about a year, been uh, within VMware for uh, closer to four years, formerly working on uh, NSX and doing automated networking and security for Kubernetes. So excited to kind of uh, help participate in this growing space of FinOps and cloud financial management. So um, one, one way we, I, we have found it's useful to frame cloud financial management uh, as a practice, as a challenge space, uh, is around what we call cloud maturity curve. And you know, I think there's, there's probably, there's probably there's several different ways out there to frame what cloud and what mon the modernization of applications or what the digitization of how we all work more agile these days, um, what that all means for us. But specifically as we go to cloud, this has been a useful framework for us to say um, whether it's an organization that's just starting to use cloud, uh, whether it's this year, whether, whether it was like 10 years ago and you know, uh, public cloud was still kind of an early thing, uh, or, or if it's just a team that's starting to use cloud more, there always starts or there seems to be a consistent pattern with uh, being able to get uh, good visibility. Uh, and and we when we talk about fin cloud financial management, specifically visibility and understanding in terms of what's driving costs. Uh, and then naturally, once in that, there's its own set of challenges there, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we're actually going to focus mostly on kind of the first two uh, little pillars here, uh, visibility and optimization. Because naturally, once you've determined what your cost drivers are, uh, there's often a reaction, uh, sometimes too quick, uh, too knee-jerk of a reaction within an organization to say, okay, what can we do to lower that bill? What can we do to lower those costs? Uh, let's do all those things. When, uh, of course, it's important to remember that we're in the cloud for a reason, or we're running this application for a reason. This application is our business, or this application is serving our business. Um, and often that's, that's, that's really number one, uh, but making sure it's done in a way that's efficient enough and not wasting resources um, is still uh, time well spent and you can make such an impact in your business, optimizing your costs in a way that makes sense for your apps and your business. Uh, and then often there's this practice of, okay, how do we do that in an ongoing fashion where we have some governance checks? We know when uh, uh, not only new cost drivers are deployed, new resources that have costs, but also uh, maybe new resources that don't have the right tags because the tag is what helps us define what's what 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 product this is and what and where that cost goes to and then kind of ultimately integrating into your business KPIs. So okay, I know that's not it's kind of a little bit of a upfront. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, also, just want to lay down this 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 concept of a, a cloud center of excellence. This is going to look different in different organizations. But it's all to say what we found over and over and over again, and, and maybe this is somewhere to you, maybe not just yet, is even if day one, you don't have multiple stakeholders caring about your cloud costs, day N, someday, uh, this becomes a multi-stakeholder conversation 
finance teams are asking. They want to report to the street how they've lowered their costs and improved gross margins, but they have to care about but where are the costs coming from? Um, oftentimes, the app teams moving on to the left side here, the developers themselves or the DevOps teams um, wanting to see, hey, I tried this ASG, this upscaling group. Uh, is it configured okay? Oh, wow, costs are spiking. Maybe it wasn't configured right. So they kind of have their own lens. And then we see this growing kind of multifunctional, uh, whether there is a central team like a cloud ops team or cloud center of excellence, or it's a combination of multiple stakeholders, like a finance person and a developer person uh, creating a cloud center of excellence, there becomes this kind of group that helps watch over those things. Okay, so again, I know it's upfront. We, we want to get to technical, useful information, but uh, hopefully if, if, you, if you're not used to thinking about cost management, hopefully those will be useful as we talk about this. So now let's get into, okay, but we're talking today about Kubernetes and what does this have to do with Kubernetes? Why do I care if I'm, if I'm running modern apps? We, we started a little bit about that from a, from a general level, but I wanted to couch this in terms of five key questions, specifically when it comes to the modern app lens of cost management and cost optimization. And I'll give and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of spoil, spoil it and say, really, I, I framed it in five questions. There's four considerations here around cost management considerations. And then the fifth is like, now let's talk about optimization for a minute. Okay, so question number one, we, we have our, we have our, our different stakeholders here. First question really is, uh, even if you don't, I think anybody kind of, uh, you may take it for granted, you may just start reporting some data, but naturally you're gonna be reporting on cost per something. And maybe you don't have to, you can start getting cost data from your cloud bill or from a tool like Cloud Health or something else. Uh, uh, but immediately you're, you're, you're just instinctually you know, couching that cost into some bucket, and then over time you're evolving, well, what do I really care about? Well, we often see with Kubernetes, especially we'll talk about uh, the, cap the challenges, but also the capabilities of certain tools like CloudHelp, like others, to get granular costs for something of a Kubernetes, within the Kubernetes constructs, this interest to say, oh, okay, great, cool. Well, obviously the more granular, the better. Um, I'm going to create a cost bucket. These are little buckets of cost, kind of bucketizing, uh, cost shares of your bill and say, well, let's put the costs from my microservice into one bucket and to your microservice in another bucket. And now we've got maybe hundreds of buckets, maybe thousands of buckets. You know, if you're a more straightforward app, maybe you've only got five microservices, it's still a microservice. So maybe it's five buckets is more manageable. But then eventually comes the question, uh, getting back to that, that finance team or the CEO or the CFO, or even the cloud ops team who has been asked to go determine uh, well, we really want to know how much each business unit is spending in the cloud. Or we really want to know what this product is costing us in the cloud. We really want to know what this uh, team, the group of teams, this group of you know different constructs, whatever the business cares about. So ultimately, uh, so this is again a, one of five considerations. This connecting of dots is is likely to happen in one form or another. You know, no organization, no two organizations are the same. But it's worth kind of thinking about that and maybe starting that conversation earlier rather than later. Uh, so, so, so you have the practices. And, and I say that because consideration two it actually has to do with your infrastructure. So you're starting to make infrastructure changes because of those cost buckets. And then you just find out maybe it's a month later, maybe it's a year later that, well, the finance team doesn't care about that. They care about this. Now I got to go deploy new tags, new labels. I mean, that's fine. We have to be agile. We have to be ready to update our Kubernetes configuration repositories and some of the default YAML configs um, frequently. Maybe it's not a problem, but it's just something to think about. So, so we talked about those cost buckets. Moving on to uh, consideration two, where are those cost buckets defined in my infrastructure? And are we using them consistently? So I've got a painted a little, very simplistic picture of a, a two worker node cluster. Uh, I guess I haven't, uh, drawn the control plane worker nodes here, but never mind. Got my, my associated disks, those also have costs. I didn't draw the network transfer costs, but those also have costs. And within my worker nodes, my VMs, my instances, uh, whatever you want to call them, depending on your platform preference, um, I've got my containers, uh, sorry, my pods. And in my pods, I've got containers. Great. Uh, so, but uh, we've got this basically this cluster construct, a label construct, and I've got my colors here kind of showing a namespace construct. 
Uh, maybe you already know what these are in Kubernetes. We've had a lot of presentations today talking about those. Won't get into that today, but I what I want to say is what we often find once uh, folks are starting to ask these cost questions is, okay, cool, cool, cool. We'll just do a cost per name space. And uh, if you skip to maybe uh, the bottom two rows here, uh, we'll, over and over again, we see organizations do cost per namespace and quickly find, oh, actually this team uses namespace a little bit different from how this team uses namespace. And I'm not here to say what the right way to use namespace is. Uh, there's probably all sorts of talks uh, elsewhere about that. But, but yeah, I, I do think Kubernetes is built as a flexible, extensible platform for a reason. But the good news is you have a lot of options. Bad news is you have a lot of options. So uh, getting some alignment on, okay, use namespace however you want um, in dev, but at least use it consistently in prod. That's where we, that's, those are the costs we really care about. Uh, or maybe that's not true for you. Maybe your dev environment's actually a pretty significant cost. And so you care about both. You wanna be consistent. It doesn't matter if it's dev environment, prod environment, dev cluster, prod cluster. Uh, we just always need to know what the product is. And then you may be looking at either labeling your namespaces uh, that are within a product or labeling your pods, uh, somehow getting that metadata in and, and whatever that whatever that metadata choice is, making sure it's consistent across the teams. Uh, it just it just makes it easier for you. Uh, but I suppose you could say, well, um, BUA is going to use uh, a label called app and BUB is going to use any uh, label called product. That's fine. You could also do that. It just creates more complexity for nailing down that cost question. So uh, I wanted to then get, so now that we talked about those kind of two considerations, I wanted to have a little quick sidebar. Why, why grouping costs when it comes to Kubernetes is challenging in the first place or why it introduces a new challenge. Maybe this is obvious to some of you, but uh, for the folks uh, who, who it may not be obvious, I wanted to start by saying, you know, like Cloud Health, one of the things we have been doing for, for some time now is helping group costs in your cloud. I've, I've picked on AWS just as an example, uh, as, as my very rudimentary diagram of here's, I've got AWS, I've got a, a bill for AWS, and in that bill, I've got lists of all sorts of services. Uh, if you know AWS, their, their bill is called the Cost and Usage Report, CUR, and for even medium-sized enterprises, you're quickly talking about millions and millions of lines of CSV, even just a matter of days or weeks or months. Uh, the, the, of, of running your, your application in the cloud. So what Cloud Health does is takes all those lines uh, you know, as a starting point, uh, gains a bunch of context, takes some simple rules you've configured. For example, everything tagged product A is a cost of product A, uh, or, or maybe it's by team. Everything tagged uh, cost by, uh, sorry, team A is cost from team A. Or maybe you have different rules. You want different metadata. Actually, everything in accounts A, B, C is from team A, and everything in accounts uh, you know, X, Y, Z is from um, team B. Whatever your rules are, configure those rules. Now we're grouping costs and we're able, in, in Cloud Health, we use this grouping mechanism called perspectives. Cloud Health, I'm, I really am just using it as an example. This is true. Uh, however, you're consuming billing data though, right? These, you, you'll get these lines for a VM. This is true also in Azure. Google does a little bit, things a little bit differently. We can talk about that too. Uh, but then to say, but what is my cost per namespace? Well, now we're actually talking about splitting the cost, for example, of an EC2 instance, because as we know, uh, as JJ just showed, another presentation showed, and my diagram on the last slide just showed, you could have multiple containers running on a node. Uh, maybe because you have a container per pod, you have multiple pods running on a node. Uh, maybe you have multiple containers in a pod, and only the one pod running a node, but one way or another, you're gonna have most likely uh, your product has some cluster and a namespace within a cluster and your pods serving that namespace. Uh, and they could be on the same worker node that's driving the cost as another application. So now I've actually got to split that cost of an instance uh, and those resources, whatever shared resources are, so I can actually get names, the cost per namespace. That's not something I get at least in an AWS bill or in an Azure bill. Uh, and you know, there's similar challenges if you're gonna talk about uh, even an on-premise uh, CFM model and you wanna kind of develop a uh, CFM practice for your on-prem resources. So this is what it looks like in Cloud Health at the end of the day. You can configure that. Uh, basically, these two constructs of grouping costs, but then distributing costs. And that kind of helps us get to the third question. Again, whether you're using Cloud Health or using something else, it's still going to be a question of, well, how do you want to split those costs? Uh, 
and just sharing from our journey and working on this for a few years now, we partnered with um, some of the early adopters of a container some years ago, and uh, at that time had some kind of product discovery sessions and, and, and did some iterative uh, uh, improvements to our, to our system, and ended up with this, this solution that does more of the left side uh, in this diagram, but there's also some you know, good reasons to do the right side. And what this is basically breaking down is, am I gonna split the cost based on what I actually used? Which seems very intuitive and is not necessarily bad practice. That's the right side. You know, uh, your pod used 10% of the, the node, you get 10% of the costs. Or are you gonna split all the, request, all the resource costs based on who asked for what? And uh, the reason why some organizations lean towards the left is because it creates a little bit of an incentive structure for your developers to uh, only ask for what they need instead of saying, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the service is gonna need. I'm just gonna ask for 10 CPUs for every pod. Well, you know, that may be safe for your for your application. And this is obviously an extreme, extreme example, but um, if you didn't need it, you're creating unnecessary cost. Uh, and if we don't have a good way of identifying that, then that's gonna that's gonna blow the cost. Even if we have a good way of identifying that. Now you've created extra work for somebody to kind of chase you down and say, did you really need 10 CPUs for that? Um, and, and, and if that automatically means, you know, if somebody else asks for one CPU and you ask for 10, uh, sorry, let's say you asked for nine, you now get 90% of the cost because you asked for this much and they asked for this much, never mind what actually got used. Um, but the flip side of the coin is, you know, you may want to actually uh, identify a cost bucket for what didn't get used for waste, uh, and that's fine. But that's the right side, which but that also has challenges. So you have to answer questions like who's going to pay for the rest, who's going to pay for those idle cycles, and it's pretty unrealistic to to expect that you're going to get to 100% utilization uh, of all your VMs, instances, worker nodes. Um, that's probably unlikely. So you're always going to have this little sliver of of unused. Sometimes it'll be a big section of unused of waste, wasted cost. Now, do you want to to kind of divvy that up as a separate step? Uh, do you want to send that to a central cost center, or do you want that to just kind of uh, naturally work itself out as part of the research application? So, uh, up to you to answer these questions. But these are some considerations we wanted to share from this learning. I know I'm getting a little close on time, so I'll try to speed up here. This is also kind of a, a more straightforward consideration. Number four. Who pays for common services? In some ways, you can think of it as similar way as the last slide, who pays for waste? Um, but obviously, it's different because waste is something that's maybe not needed, you want to get rid of. But common service is not something you want to get rid of. It's something that's serving the common good. Maybe it's serving multiple applications or multiple services, multiple microservices. Um, JJ mentioned things like service mesh. So if you're rolled out Istio uh, and you're using compute resources to have a sidecar for every pod, uh, well, that's additional overhead. Who pays for that, right? And I think there again, there's there's different. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's something uh, you may eventually get to, and it's a question you'll you'll want to answer and just just have established for your business and for your cloud financial management practice. And then, as I mentioned, fifth, um, we're a little bit on time, and you know, I could speak for an hour just on this on its own, but this is kind of okay. This is that that the last step of. Well, I see where all my cost drivers are. What do I do about it? What can I do about it to reduce the cost? And these are four, what I would call, I think, four major areas of cost reduction opportunities or efficiency driving opportunities uh, in, in your Kubernetes clusters. But probably there are others, and I'd, be, I'd love to stop you know, and get some feedback. But I, I could just quickly explain just to make sure we're on the same page. Pod right sizing is similar to that. It's actually what we were talking about a couple slides ago when we said, what did the pod ask for of Kubernetes? What were those requests? Was it really what it needed to? And you have open source projects like the vertical pod autoscaler where it can say, hey, you asked for 10 CPUs, but you only used one. We're going to update your YAML for you. And so next time you only ask for one because we've watched you for a long time and you really only ever use one. Cool. Now your pods are by size. It's like we're going in, uh, through the Russian doll starting with the smallest. Going to the next layer in the Russian doll, node right sizing. Uh, if we're packing all these nodes, uh, sorry, packing these uh, pods into nodes, are the nodes always having a lot of extra room? They could be right sized a little bit, maybe use a different VM type instance type, great. Uh, third, auto scaling, 
when you, when you spanning out your pod resources, your node resources, are you doing more than you have to? And then finally, fourth has nothing to do with infrastructure. And if you're new to cloud financial management or cost management, uh, there's this notion in most cloud platforms to kind of commit to using something and actually getting a better rate back. Uh, we could again go. I could I could go into that for for quite some time. Uh, I'm going to pause there and, and let's let's. Hey, uh, Ron, is this a good time? Maybe we can open it up for questions. Uh, absolutely. Let me see if we've got any. I think there's so much valuable information. It's going to take a little while for people to absorb it all. You know, my key takeaway, which I think is so relevant in this presentation, is you need lots of different tools from a security standpoint with Trend Micro to do things right, from a migration perspective with Rackspace, from a data management with NetApp. And then a fourth piece of the puzzle is with Cloud Health offers to ensure you're administrating these technology solutions you're deploying and making sure you're not caught off guard with suddenly getting a huge bill. And they could ensure that the technology decisions and the financial justification that people often promote actually happen. Is that about right, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. 